Hello, everybody. Um, welcome in this webinar. Um, thank you very much to all of you uh, to make some time to join this webinar regarding the NIST 2 directive, uh, a new directive that will be come into force uh, in September next year. Uh, it's decided on European level and uh, it will now be translated in national law in Europe. So uh, together with uh, SkyTail, a brand compliance partner, um, um, I think that we can give you some insights in the NIS2 directive, how you can prepare and uh, what kind of things that you need to know regarding the NIS. And uh, I think that in the common, let's say 40, 50 minutes, uh, we will guide you through the NIS, some specific topics, uh, but also how you can prepare yourself uh, if you use, for example, a tool like SkyTail. Um, I will quickly and briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kuhn Mathes. I'm a business unit manager within brand compliance. Together with a team of business and account managers, um, I'm responsible for the business development part of the ISMS, the item and GDPR solutions, but also for SOC 2 um, audits within brand compliance. Uh, I have more than 12 years of experience within the government and uh, seven years of experience within an international uh, consultancy firm. Um, I'm not alone today. Uh, I also invited uh, a co-speaker. Uh, Kyle, maybe you can introduce yourself. Perfect. Thank you, Quinn. And again, hello to everyone and thank you for joining us. So as Quinn mentioned, I am Kyle Morris. I'm one of the senior managers in compliance success at Sitale. I, I began my uh, working career in an IT audit or tech assurance space and I've got a ton of uh, experience in various companies from mining, manufacturing, healthcare, uh, financial services and I now find myself in a position where I work with customers from around the world with the aim to maximize the value they get out of their various compliance requirements that they need. Nobody really likes compliance so to try and make the process fast, valuable and efficient for them is really what my goal is on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Kyle. Um, yeah, I will start with the presentation. So later on in this presentation, uh, Kyle will uh, go further into the details of how SkyTail can help you. Um, so, but let's start uh, with the NIS, uh, how you can demonstrate compliance to NIS 2.0. Um, I just have some small topics, uh, the differences between NIS and NIS 2.0. Um, because maybe most of you already knows that um, there are quite a lot of people um, that invested quite a lot of time in uh, the implementation of NIS. Um, but although it's only came into force in 2018, um, now there will become a NIS 2.0 after, let's say, five, six years. Um, I will zoom in a bit more into depth about the NIS 2 and also about compliance. So a quick overview, the NIS versus NIS 2.0. Um, I mentioned already that um, the old NIS directive, it become into force in, in 2016 already, um, but there were some um, yeah, parts that needs to be done, just like we are now in the same phase. Uh, it, it came into force. Uh, the NIST 2 came into force last year in December, uh, but now it's transposition time and it needs to transpose in national law. Uh, um, you see here for the NIST, it was the same in 2018. Um, it needs to be transposed into national law. Today for NIST 2.0, it needs to be transposed in national law uh, by September of next year. So it needs to become into force uh, October of 2024. Um, there were also some specific uh, parts in time for the NIS, for example, um, a review of how uh, well NIS was uh, followed up. And after that follow up of the NIS, there was some issues with uh, how it was follow up on a European level. NIST, it stands for Network and Information Security Directive. Um, and it's all about cooperation 
information exchange, uh, notification of breaches, and, and the most uh, important part, um, really the key of the NIST directive, uh, the, the measures regarding to cybersecurity and the measures regarding to cybersecurity management. Um, but after five years and with the first reviews, it um, was crystal clear that the approach of the European Union, it did not work. Uh, so every country in uh, Europe, there was, they can, they could decide um, on their own if certain uh, sectors, but also some specific uh, organizations fell under the NIS, yes or no. Uh, um, it was also unclear the, the type of fines and because every country has their own view on it and they decided quite a lot how to transpose it into national law. Um, so it was unclear what was, uh, for example, um, falling under the NIS in Belgium or in the Netherlands, that was quite a difference. Uh, and although they are two countries laying next to each other, um, it was not that clear. Uh, so evaluation was also not that effective. So in 2020, 2021, uh, next to that, there was also, I think that everybody was aware of it, a pandemic. And uh, there were, um, for example, the hospitals, it was crystal clear that the hospitals in the whole world, um, they really are essential. And uh, although they were so essential, in Europe, some uh, big hospitals, they suffered a cyber incident during uh, the pandemic. And those uh, kinds of, um, of uh, issues during the pandemic also raised uh, on a European level the idea that uh, the NIS directive needs an urgent update. So the NIS 2, um, it started uh, to, to show up in 2020, 2021, uh, that the NIS 2 was really crucial. Um, one of the people who was also investing quite a lot in uh, the NIS 2 is Bart Grothuis. It's a, a politician from the Netherlands. And he said it quite correctly. Uh, cybercrime, it doubled in 2019. Uh, ransomware was tripled in 2020. And still companies and institutions are spending in Europe um, 41% less on cybersecurity than they do uh, in the US. And we must strengthen European cybersecurity and create the tools to handle cyber incidents together when they occur. Um, and really key in how they approach the NIST 2 um, directive was, we cannot stop all cybercrime from occurring, but we can protect ourselves better than before and better than others. And th that sentence is really crucial, how they uh, approach the NIST 2. Um, so the new legislation of the EU uh, makes it a safe place to work and to do business. I make or I made a small um, recap from the NIST uh, and the NIST 2. Uh, where are some differences and what is really crucial? Uh, um, what is the scope for NIST and, and for NIST 2? Uh, everything related to electronic communications network or a device or group of interacted related devices, a network of computers, a network uh, where we share data through and digital data stored, processed, retrieved, or transmitted. Uh, uh, but that's really the focus of uh, the NIS. Um, the affected entities, there is quite a big change between the NIS and the NIS 2. Uh, under the NIS, the, the previous one, only operators of essential services and digital service providers were mentioned. Now in NIS 2, uh, they mentioned essential entities and important entities. Later on in the presentation, I will give just a recap of what kind of uh, entities will fall under the NIS 2.0. Um, regarding incident reporting obligations, um, if there uh, occurs an incident, 
um, in the past, in the NIS, there was no delay and uh, without undue delay, you have 72 hours um, to um, mention the incident to the supervisory authority. Um, in NIS 2, it will become 24 hours, so less time than it was under the NIS. Um, also, you need to share the experience of the incident that other companies, but also supervisory authorities and governments, they can learn from the incidents uh, that pops up and that they are uh, in the possibility to, um, yeah, if there are some options, um, to see that the, the incident um, can stop as soon as possible and that not other companies will be affected or not other institutions will be affected. Um, security requirements uh, in the NIS, the focus was laying on risk management and incident prevention. Um, that's more or less the same in NIS too, but there are more uh, detailed examples and also there are some stricter um, requirements that you need to follow. Supervision and enforcement. Um, in the NIS, it depends uh, upon receipt of evidence of a breach, and it can be the case that supervisory authorities can do an audit. Um, this is also a bit different um, in the new NIS 2.0. Um, it depends if you're an essential or an important entity, um, but the supervisory authority can perform audits, can do inspections, can ask uh, a security report or a security scan. Um, they have the option to request all the information. Um, and uh, that's important. And for the people who are familiar with the GDPR, it will not be so um, unexpected. But uh, in the NIS 2.0, there is an enforcement um, where the supervisory authority have the power to give warnings, orders, fines, um, that are more or less um, on the same approach as GDPR. Um, a big difference in NIS 2.0 is the approach to the senior management. Um, in NIS 2.0, so as of uh, September, October next year, uh, the senior management or management bodies, they will become accountable for non-compliance through the NIS 2.0. So the management needs to be informed and trained as well uh, regarding to cybersecurity. Management body follows specific trainings uh, on a regular basis, and, and it's really crucial uh, to start with it as soon as possible as an organization, um, because yeah, if the management is uh, accountable, they need to have at least some basic knowledge uh, to be able uh, to make the necessary um, decisions, also to guide the organizations and to be aware of um, what NIST 2.0 means for the organization. Um, in NIST, there was also a registration option, uh, but in NIST 2.0, companies need to register with the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, also known as ENISA. I mentioned before um, that the essential entities and important entities in NIS 2.0, that it now is more clear than it was under the NIS. Uh, in essential entities, we have the energy sector, we have transport organizations, uh, we have the banking and the financial market infrastructure, uh, everything related to health, um, drinking water and wastewater, digital infrastructure, public administration or the government, and everything related to space. Those uh, type of organization and sectors, they fall under the essential entities. Next to that, you have the important entities uh, like postal and courier services, waste management, manufacture production and distribution of chemicals, food production, processing and, and distribution, uh, so also re regarding transport and, and transport of food and uh, that's fall under um, important entities, manufacturing and digital providers.
I see a question pops up from uh, one of the attendees. Are MSPs also include under the important entities? Um, I think that they are, um, but with MSPs, what to be crystal clear um, with MSP, you mentioned, what do you mean? Still waiting. Managed service providers, yeah, indeed, they fall under uh, the important entities. Um, it depends a bit if what they offer exactly. Uh, um, most of the time, they can be seen as a digital provider, um, but that depends. Uh, managed service providers, um, but we will come uh, on the next slide. They will, if they not fall under the NIST directive directly, indirectly they will fall under uh, the NIS. And the reason before that is that um, on the next slide, one of the things that is crucial in the NIS is the supply chain security. Uh, but I will come to that point within a couple of seconds. Um, for NIS 2.0, so all medium-sized and large companies in the selected sectors, and just like I mentioned before, essential and important, they would be covered by the legislation. Um, but member states, so countries, would be able to identify smaller entities with a high security risk profile, uh, uh, while cybersecurity would become the responsibility of the highest managerial level. If a small organization is crucial, is essential, or uh, has a high security risk, then still they can fall under the NIST 2.0. But also, uh, and it's also related to the question uh, before uh, regarding the managed service providers, if a managed service provider or a smaller company works for an entity, an organization that falls under the NIST 2.0, and if they um, work with the data or that they process some data of the organization, um, then indeed they also need to demonstrate that they have the same level of security the same approach uh, to the NIS, and that's part of the requirements to supply chain security if you would like to work with a company uh, and if you would like to demonstrate that you as an organization are NIS 2 compliant um, then you need also to show that your suppliers are uh, in line with the NIST 2.0. So regarding to that, a managed service provider, uh, they will fall under the NIST more indirectly than directly. Um, requirements regarding the NIST, uh, just a small recap, incident response, supply chain security. Um, we see it in a lot of sectors already today. Uh, if an organization uh, has, for example, an ISO certificate, Quite often, they demand or uh, they ask it to their suppliers as well. Okay, you would like to work for us, no problem, but then you need to show that you also are ISO certified. That part is really uh, important. Um, in this 2.0, also the focus on encryption, vulnerability disclosure, but there are some other uh, things and other provisions. Um, Last point that I need to, or that I would like to touch is the directive also establish a framework for better cooperation and for information sharing, um, and that can be set up by the different supervisory authorities or by the different member states. Um, and also, there is a real focus on a European vulnerability database uh, that will be um, tackled by ENISA. So. Uh, there is a focus on a European vulnerability database. Just some takeaways, uh, if you would like to start with NIST 2.0 um, and where to start as well, um, consider that there is some overlap with GDPR. For example, uh, in GDPR organizations, they need to appoint a DPO. Um, in the NIST, it's not strict that you need to appoint uh, a person, but at least you need to appoint a representative. Uh, it can be the same person at this point, but um, take a closer look on that. Where is the overlap with, for example, GDPR? But also consider applicable law and jurisdiction. Uh, it's really important um, 
that you don't do the same effort twice, um, but that you have a look, uh, is there some applicable law or where we uh, already invested a lot and, and uh, can we use, for example, GDPR or our, our parts? Um, the registration of an ESA or your local uh, supervisory authority, um, appoint a representative, I already touched that point. Um, also have a look, review or refresh the, the existing security measures. For example, if you now stated, because your organizations uh, fell under the NIS um, and you um, made up a process that you take into account 72 hours um, if you uh, suffering an incident, yeah, now you need to refresh that, um, update it that you only have 24 hours. Um, develop an effective cyber incident and a response plan are really crucial also in the NIS. It's uh, the, a response plan or business continuity plan. Um, one of the key elements uh, regarding NIS 2.0, inform and train the management, the board, uh, board of directors, um, inform them, start with it, uh, because they are really um, a accountable in the future so they need to be aware of um, what they need to take into account and what is coming on their way um, prepare also some negotiations and requests from on one hand the customers but on the other hand also for your suppliers if you ask your suppliers to show that they are NIST 2 compliant prepare then uh, that you have for example uh, um, a document what they need to deliver or where you just uh, write down your expectations regarding your suppliers but on the other hand also prepare your organizations from questions that will pop up from out your customers but how can you demonstrate now compliance to nist.0 um in this point um in time ISO 27001, it was for the NIS 1 uh, or, or the previous NIS. Um, it was in Europe seen as if you have an ISO 27001 certificate, you're more or less uh, compliant to NIS. For NIS 2.0, uh, it will remain the same that if you have an ISO 27001 certificate, you will be seen as NIS compliant. But, and I mentioned it here before, um, Next to that, also be aware that there are some NIST 2.0 specific controls and they need to be implemented as well. So don't forget, there are, I think that it are 18 NIST 2.0 specific controls next to ISO 27001. Uh, but the most easy way to show that you're compliant to NIST 2.0 will be an ISO 27001 certificate. Um, I already mentioned that uh, there will also be a local framework that can be installed. Uh, for example, in Belgium, uh, they invested quite some time in it, um, but they start sharing their information and they have um, made up a cyber fundamental framework. Uh, the CNIL from uh, France also uh, start with building a sort of a framework, uh, but in Belgium, it's already adapted and, and shared with um, a lot of organizations. And it's called Cyber Fundamentals in Belgium. So you can implement it, but also you can audit and certify against that framework. But it's only effective for organizations in Belgium, uh, because for example, if you have a Cyber Fundamental certificate in Belgium, at this point in time, it doesn't have much value outside of Belgium, uh, where uh, ISO 27001, it's really an international standard, but the local frameworks, the local um, cyber fundamentals, um, for example, um, yeah, that's only have some value in the country itself. What also is a, is a possibility to show that you're compliant is that the outcome done by or the outcome of an audit done by a supervisory authority. Um, it's a bit strange, but if a supervisory authority would like to audit you as a company, you will receive an audit report, and at the end, um, you can show that your audit, that the outcome of the audit was positive, and that you're NIST to uh, compliant. 
You cannot ask an audit uh, from the supervisory authority, but they choose what kind of organizations of what kind of um, institutions they will perform an audit uh, on. And at the last uh, part, there are some IT audits, and uh, this audit report, uh, SOC 2, and uh, that can also be partly or in, in whole, um, but then you need to share the report. Um, the audit report can also show that you are NIST 2 compliant. This was my part of the presentation. Um, just to give a small introduction to the NIST 2.0, also some to point some attention points uh, from outside of the NIST. Um, but I'm gladly to give the word to Kyle, and uh, Kyle will guide you through the SkyTail uh, tool and to see how SkyTail can help you with uh, the NIST 2.0. Kyle, go ahead. Perfect. Thank you, Kun. And I think maybe a, a really good place to, to begin is with a, a quote that says, if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. And this maybe really hits home for a lot of people. And if we talk about the regulatory requirements here and a few points that I want to quickly just go over before we dive into the automation platform itself is just to recap on some of the high level points with the NISU directive itself. So as you can see, there are new repercussions and really harsh fines and penalties for non-compliance that include fines up to 10 million euros or 2% of a global turnover, which obviously could have a really, really big impact on any organization. Kun has already mentioned this earlier, but if you think about security compliance in one way or another, people either do it, I mean, in the case of NIST, because it's a, a regulatory requirement and you don't have a choice around it, but often before customers want to go into partnership or work with a the company, they want that assurance. Are, are they, is the organization itself safe? How can they trust what's happening with their data and what processes are happening? And this is done by an external verification. So it enables higher sales targets. It allows you to have trust in the organizations you're working with. And you just have that peace of mind with what's actually happening with your data. So a quick recap here is that the NIST directive will apply to all essential and important entities that have a headcount of 250 people or more and an annual turnover of 50 million euros or a balance sheet standing exceeding 43 million euros. In terms of the incident management process, this was already mentioned briefly earlier, but it, it really is a, a very important consideration and something to take note of with how the standard has changed and that significant incidents need to be reported within one day or 24 hours, a full notification to be issued within 72 hours of being made aware of the incident, and finally, to close out the process, within a month of submission, uh, there needs to be a final report uh, concluding and documenting what happened. So three main points of focus for NIST 2. In terms of increasing cybersecurity resilience for essential services, to streamline the process. So as we've already covered earlier today, the original NIS wasn't clear. And so the NIS 2 directive, it gives more clarity and it also enforces harsher penalties. And finally, um, just to have better preparedness in terms of how to deal with cybersecurity attacks and incidents overall. In terms of what is required within NIS 2, there are, there are a lot of different requirements that include risk analysis, different policies and processes. As mentioned already, specific processes around incident handling, business continuity and disaster recovery, training of management from a cybersecurity and best practices, computer hygiene, which really just talks around the security of devices, cryptography, human resource controls and policies, access management, and security of network and information systems. So as you can see, it's quite a long list and often organizations that begin with this will sort of get to a point where they go, well, how do we begin and what do we do? And very true to the point you can see here, being compliant, it's a must. It's not a nice to have. It's something organizations need to do. But any form of compliance is often, it's, it's something companies don't want to go through. It takes time. It's complex. There are tight deadlines you're trying to meet and couple this on top of your normal daily work, it really can make it difficult. So this is where an organization like Cytel really comes into play and can take this complicated 
process that you don't want to go through and really get rid of the headache around it. So as you can see, a few main points of focus here is you as an organization, if you are required to be NIST compliant, you need to have certain requirements that we've already covered. So using a platform and an organization such as Cytel, we guide and often the word handholding is, is used because it's, it's not a case of an organization must try and figure out what they need to do. It's guidance from start to end, which includes providing policy templates for everything that's needed, a guided process around risk analysis and mitigation, as well as the remediation plan, trainings for security awareness, templates for asset inventories, and the platform itself just simplifies the layout that you need to ensure continuous and accurate compliance. So as you can see, also the final point there that really, really helps with the simplification and the continuous audit assessment is automations and integrations. So modern, modern times call for modern measures and a lot of companies make use of a ton of cloud providers and third party tools that carry out uh, a lot of the processes for them, be this uh, your cloud providers, your source control tools, your HR tools, often they are external parties and vendors that are used. So what works really nicely here is to be able to get an assessment and insights from all of those tools themselves in a centralized platform that I'll show you in a few moments. Uh, I want to quickly maybe touch on a comment we have. Is there an overview of the extra controls? Yes. So what we do in terms of the site tail layout, and I, I maybe want to just go through this by using the platform itself, is as Quinn mentioned earlier, there are ways to be in this compliance by achieving compliance with other controls or other frameworks rather. So what we would do, again, to really maximize that benefit for you and the value out of it, is if you were seeking and you need to abide and comply with NIST, develop a framework and have the controls laid out in the platform so it's clear. These are the controls we need to implement and have in place, what is required for each control, guidance through that, and we could in turn have a setup in the platform where you, for example, have an audit framework for NIST and you have an audit framework for ISO. So obviously the overlap would be really clear and easy to separate between them. And then the specific controls needed for NIST would be laid out in that audit framework itself. So you can see the old, fesh, old fashioned audit methodology is tons of folders, tons of manual spreadsheets. And this really gets simplified into a really, really nice simplified platform layout. So the, the various different sections in the platform obviously help to achieve sections I've already made mention of. So to have an overview at any point in time, no matter what framework you're currently undergoing and trying to be compliant with, a task section that will pop up and notify you of where you require remediation, overdue tasks, anything like that. So you don't have to go and do the digging. At any point in time when something's required, the platform will notify you of this and you'll be able to easy, easily remediate it and have it in place. In terms of automation itself, it's you can see the many benefits on here. It makes it easier, it makes it faster, and again, it gets rid of that human error. By plugging into different tools, instead of you making an assessment or an analysis about if something's right or wrong, mapping that to what a framework and a standard requires gives you a very simple output and answer to it. Is it acceptable or does it need to be improved and corrected? So as you can see, in other words, automation streamlines the process. You have a single source of truth. You're not worried, again, going back to that old manual process of folders and documents in different places. Everything's on the platform. It's where the assessments get done and the continuous audit. This really is a, a very big value add because you, you want to have as little compliance requirements as possible, but it's not something that you do once and then you're done. It needs to continuously be done. And if we talk and go back to the penalties in place, if you've remediated and got yourself to a point where you are ready and you're compliant, and then you become really blase and relaxed about it, six months down the line, your processes in place may have significantly changed and you're not actually sure where your audit standing is. So this is again where the platform will notify you where things have changed and where they are no longer aligned. So we have a, a, a quick few graphics where audits, audits can be fun and maybe just touching on the integrations I mentioned earlier. So as you can see, our platform allows you to, to plug in 
and we take care of the rest of it for you, if, if I can put it simply. Plugins with your different cloud providers, such as AWS, GCP, Azure, your different source control tools, such as GitHub and GitLab, endpoint management tools, HR tools, uh, database tools, anything like that that can manually collect evidence. Obviously, it's, it's very securely collected, and only what's relevant to the audit is obtained because that's what's required to demonstrate that ongoing compliance. Going back to the continuous monitoring we already touched on, here's just a brief example of where there would be a task created to show, for example, from an authentication perspective with users, maybe there is a user that has recently joined the organization and somehow was able to bypass that process of enforcing MFA. So the platform will alert you of that. This is done by obviously having integrations with the relevant tools. We'll pop out a task for you, you remediate it, the platform continually iterates and will check this data and we'll be able to close it out and give you a standing at any point in time where your errors are and where you need to focus on remediation. Moving on to the compliance process. So this is what we talk about when I make mention of the different frameworks and layouts that we have. So for example, here you can see we've got mapped an ISO framework. Within it, we have the layout of the different ISMS and annex controls. And then from this process, you're able to see exactly where you are. Your compliance will be demonstrated by having collected the evidence, that being verified and then independently audited if it's a relevant framework that requires an external order to be conducted. And this is where all your information will be held. And then as you can see here, here's the audit management page. So an organization, and again, that value out of the platform itself, where there is an overlap. So for example, if, if you are going for NIS and you've had customers that require or want you to be able to prove ISO compliance or GDPR compliance, where there is an overlap in controls and where it's appropriate and allowed from an audit methodology perspective, you're not going to have to collect and upload evidence three times. This will automatically be performed by the platform to apply, to apply it across to the different frameworks where it's relevant, and it simplifies that process for you instead of you doing it three times over. Of course, where you have different frameworks that are governed by specific audit periods, it changes slightly but you're able to assess the underlying controls and the baselines for what's in place. So there really is a very big emphasis on being able to be compliant with multiple frameworks as easily as possible. And if you're still unsure about why you would want to use an automation platform, it's faster, it's less work, and it's cheaper. You're getting rid of a large portion of the manual human elements you're being directed on what you need to do. You're being guided through this. You're not trying to figure out from spreadsheets what you need to do. You have dedicated support and it makes the headache go away for you and it gets you compliant quicker so you face less penalties and repercussions for non-compliance. Okay, that pretty much sums that up. I see another control for, uh, sorry, another control, another question relates to SOC 1. So in terms of how this works and going back, our platform caters for, for SOC 1, for SOC 2, for ISA, for HIPAA, for NIST, whatever a customer's requirements may be. In terms of for SOC 1, this is done as part of the initial assessments. So we would facilitate introductory meetings that would be us as Cytel, you as the customer, and the audit partner to go through, identify, and develop those business controls that are required, and then get to a point where we would onboard those to the platform so we can collect the evidence and check the actual compliance status of them. So again, very, very, very good question actually, because it's not a, a set list in this case, but again, that assessment and identification of what the controls are, are done in the initial kickoff gap analysis or th those first sort of steps of the audit process itself. I hope that answers that question. And I see there is more typing, so I'll wait for more. Okay, so another question on SOC 2, did you translate the points of focus? So this has been a collaborative process with a lot of different audit partners from a big four perspective, and it's done on a continuous basis still. So what we did is we obviously took the five different criteria and we mapped those principles and the, the requirements within them to specific controls. This then sort of paves the the foundation or the basis of what the audit should cover. And then obviously on an individual perspective with a framework like SOC2 being quite flexible, 
we would then assess to see what controls are relevant for a customer and what controls maybe wouldn't be required. Because again, if you look at it from the other way, undergoing a framework such as SOC 2 and that audit report that a customer may want to see, the question that you'd want to be asking is, would your customers want you to have these controls included? Obviously controls around risk assessments and encryption and important controls like that are a no-brainer. You have to have them in place. But depending on how your product works, which is obviously what the SOC 2 process is assessing, there's certain flexibility in your controls there. So to sum it up, it's an ongoing review process that's been done with the auditors to map each one of the different principles and controls to get the framework layout, which we have in the platform today. Perfect. And that's, that sums up my part, Kun. Thank you very much, Kyle. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, as we can see, there is a lot of work to do uh, really regarding to NIST 2, uh, specifically for organizations uh, uh, that falls under the NIST 2, but didn't fall under the NIST directive. Um, although I also think that a lot of organizations already invested something in uh, cybersecurity, I think this is the time uh, and, and definitely because also the management needs to be aware of it. Uh, they are accountable. I keep on repeating it uh, of how important that will be. Uh, definitely for the people um, who need to implement or who need to follow up uh, the NIST too. Uh, it will help you in your work if the management is accountable as well. Um, so on that part, I think that um, the journey of NIS, uh, it will not start September next year, but it will start uh, as soon as possible. So uh, for that, I think uh, that keep in mind that we still have more than one year, uh, but don't wait until uh, September of next year. Um, I really would like to thank Kyle uh, for uh, the impressive information and, and, and to show what Skytail can do for the organization and for us. Um, I also would like to uh, thank you all, uh, the attendees, uh, to join this webinar. And uh, I hope that it was inter uh, interactive enough uh, and also interesting for all of you. Uh, if there are some questions, don't hesitate. You can always uh, send us an email. Uh, you can always uh, reach out to us. And uh, I wish you a pleasant Wednesday. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Quinn. And thank you to all the attendees.